So we're on a quest to discover the splitting field for an irreducible polynomial over the rationals. In other words, what field of numbers do we need in order to discover all of the roots of a given irreducible polynomial over the rationals? In the last video, we talked about how to include a bare minimum of non-real numbers within a field in order to get the process of constructing a splitting field started. We call that extension a cyclotomic extension of the rationals. For example, if I have an eighth degree polynomial like t to the eighth minus 13, which is irreducible over the rationals, then I might expect that the non-real numbers I need to include in my splitting field for this polynomial consists of those non-real numbers whose eighth power is real, specifically whose eighth power is equal to one. Let's keep things simple. The extension which gives us all of those eighth roots of one is called the eighth cyclotomic extension of the rationals, q adjoins zeta eight. But it turned out, we saw in the last video, that this extension only has degree four over the rationals, having a basis of one i square root of two and i times the square root of two. How is that different than an extension where maybe I have a polynomial like t to the fifth minus 11? So now I have a fifth order polynomial, and I want to extend to get all of the non-real fifth roots of unity. What is the degree of this extension going to be? In this video, we're going to see how the story is very different if we take a cyclotomic extension to get a root of unity that is of prime order versus getting a root of unity that is of composite order. For example, the eighth cyclotomic field is an extension by the eighth root of unity, and eight is composite, whereas the fifth cyclotomic field is an extension by the fifth root of unity, and five is prime. We're going to see in this video how those two cyclotomic fields actually have a very different structure over the rationals, and it's only because we're extending by either a prime order root of unity, or a composite order, root of unity. So in the last video, we found out that the eighth cyclotomic polynomial, in other words, the minimal polynomial for the extension of the eighth cyclotomic field over the rationals, is t to the fourth plus one. And therefore, the eighth cyclotomic field is actually a degree four extension of q. But the story is very different if we dial back from eight to seven. If I have the primitive seventh root of unity, e to the two pi i over seven, what does the extension by that over q look like? Well, we have to include all of its powers, and all the powers of zeta 7 are arrayed in a regular heptagon inscribed in the unit circle. We know that a polynomial that this seventh root of unity satisfies is t to the seventh minus 1. But in order to find the minimal polynomial, we also need to find the irreducible factor, the irreducible factor that zeta 7 is a root of. And so we need to factor t to the seventh minus 1. We can do that by first factoring out a t minus 1 from that polynomial, and getting the remainder, t to the sixth plus t to the fifth plus t to the fourth plus t to the third plus t squared plus t plus one, and then asking the question, since we know that that first factor, t minus one, has a root of one and not zeta seven, therefore zeta seven must be a root of that other factor, one plus t all the way up to t to the sixth. But is that irreducible? Well, this polynomial we can show is irreducible by just shifting t to t plus one, when I shift t to t plus 1, I get this polynomial, t to the 6th plus 7t to the 5th plus 21t to the 4th, 35t cubed, 35t squared, 21t plus 7. And you'll notice that those coefficients are all exactly the binomial coefficients in the seventh row of Pascal's triangle. And all of them, except for the 1 in the front of t to the 6th, is a multiple of 7. And since the constant term is not a multiple of 7 squared, which is 49, this polynomial satisfies Eisenstein's criterion with a prime seven. Therefore, p of t plus one is irreducible, and hence p itself is irreducible over the rationals by Eisenstein's criterion. That makes this sixth order polynomial the minimal polynomial for zeta seven over q. And so when I adjoin a seventh root of unity, I end up getting a degree six extension of the rationals. And a basis for this extension might consist of the largest subset of rationally independent powers of zeta 7 that we find arranged around this unit circle. So that starts with 1. It includes zeta 7 itself, and as well as the second power, third power, fourth power, and fifth power. So I can include all six of those, and all six of those are independent over q. If they were not, then we could find a polynomial of degree less than 5, less than or equal to 5, uh, of which zeta 7 is a root. But that's a contradiction to the fact that our minimal polynomial has degree 6. But it's actually more conventional to use a slightly different basis for the seventh cyclotomic field over q. Rather than using the first through four fifth powers of zeta 7 along with the number 1, why don't we use the sixth power, 
Well, I can't throw the sixth power into this basis because now this basis is no longer rationally independent. Because exactly if I add up all of these elements from one up through the sixth power of zeta seven, then I get zero. And so that's a non-trivial linear combination of these elements that gives us zero. So I can't include zeta six to the seven unless I throw something else away. And it's conventional if I include that sixth power that I throw away the number one. And so a basis might also be thought of as the set of all powers of the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth order of this primitive seventh root of unity. Let's quickly just take a survey of some other examples. The fifth root of unity has a minimal polynomial of t to the fourth plus t cubed plus t squared plus t plus one. So the fifth cyclotomic field is actually a fourth degree extension of the rationals, just like the eighth was. That's interesting. The sixth root of unity, the sixth primitive root of unity, has as its minimal polynomial, well, not t to the six minus one, because that's not irreducible, and not t cubed plus one times t cubed minus one, because that's but neither of the, those factors are not irreducible either. We can factor the first using the sum of cubes technique and the second using the difference of cubes technique. Now we have these four factors, each of which is irreducible. So the only question now is which one of them has zeta six as its root? And it turns out to be the second one, t squared minus t plus one. Therefore, a minimal polynomial for zeta six over q, in other words, the sixth cyclotomic polynomial is just quadratic, t squared minus t plus one. That's interesting. How about the ninth, t to the ninth minus one, if we factor it to the extent that we can. We can start using the difference of cubes technique, and then factor the t cubed minus one using a difference of cubes technique, and we get a product of a linear factor, a quadratic factor, and a sixth degree factor. That linear factor has as a root one, not zeta nine. The quadratic factor has zeta six as one of its roots, not zeta nine. Therefore, the irreducible factor that remains, t to the six plus t cubed plus one, is the minimal polynomial for zeta nine over q. And so the ninth cyclotomic field is actually degree six over the rationals. How about the tenth? Well, through the same sort of factoring process, we can find that the tenth cyclotomic polynomial is t to the fourth minus t cubed plus t squared minus t plus one. So it looks a lot like zeta five, except we're alternating the signs now, but it has the same degree, four. Do you see a pattern here? It's certainly not obvious. But here's an observation that we can make. That the degree of this cyclotomic field over q also happens to coincide with the maximum number of linearly independent powers of zeta k. What is that maximum number? Well, in our example for zeta seven, all of those powers were independent over q precisely because when we look in the exponents of the powers of zeta seven, we have these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, and six, each of which is relatively prime to seven. And so we can't take a power of it and land in the same place that zeta seven lands. So here's our conjecture, that the degree of the nth cyclotomic extension, the kth cyclotomic extension, sorry, is the maximum number of linearly independent powers of zeta k, which is the same thing as the number of residues that are co-prime to k. In other words, the number of natural numbers that are less than k and which do not have a common factor other than one with k. We call that something. We call that Euler's totient function. Euler's totient function counts the number of natural numbers less than k for which the greatest common divisor of that number in k is equal to one. This is a function that shows up a lot in number theory, and here it is showing up in the study of cyclotomic fields. So what we want to do next is take a quick flyover on what is the structure of these cyclotomic fields over the rationals, and in particular, how does it relate to group theory? And as promised, the story is going to be very different for a prime value of k versus a composite value of k. Let's take k equals five, just to keep things relatively simple. The primitive fifth root of unity and all of its powers are arranged in a regular pentagon inscribed in the unit circle. The fifth cyclotomic field has a basis of one zeta five, zeta five squared, zeta five to the third over q. A minimal polynomial for this is that fifth cyclotomic polynomial, t to the fourth plus t cubed plus t squared plus t plus one. And therefore, this is a degree four extension of the rational. So if we could visualize what this looks like as a vector space over q, it's this four dimensional vector space and these linearly independent axes are one zeta five, zeta five squared, and zeta five to the third. Now, zeta five is kind of special here because zeta five can claim that it actually generates all of the other elements that belong to this basis. All of the powers of zeta five actually run through the elements of this basis. When we get to zeta five to the fourth and zeta five to the fifth, we end up back at one. So actually, we're gonna do the conventional thing and take away one and just replace it with zeta five to the fourth to make our life a little bit easier. 
Now here's a question. Are there other choices that we could have made that are indistinguishable from zeta 5? In other words, zeta 5 itself we know generates every element in this basis. But if I were to sort of stick that rabbit back into a hat and then pull it back out again, and I get something that still says, hey, I generate the basis, then what might that element be? What other elements might generate all of the elements in this basis and therefore be indistinguishable from zeta 5? Well, how about zeta 5 squared, e to the 4 pi i over 5? What do its powers look like? Well, its second power ends up at e to the 8 pi i over 5, its third power at e to the 2 pi i over 5, the fourth power e to the 6 pi i over 5, the fifth power back at 1. Therefore, zeta 5 squared also generates all of the basis elements for this fifth cyclotomic field over q. And therefore, we're going to consider it to be indistinguishable from the point of view of, of abstract algebra from zeta 5 itself. And likewise, zeta 5 cubed will also generate all of the powers in this basis. And so zeta 5 cubed is indistinguishable from zeta 5 to the first from the point of view of this extension over q. So what are we really doing here? We're kind of taking our original generator of the basis, zeta 5, and sort of sticking in that hat and pulling something back out. And if something that we pull back out is also has the same property of generating the entire basis, we're going to consider it to be indistinguishable from zeta 5 itself. But that actually gives us four different fifth roots of unity that are all indistinguishable as far as the algebraic structure that they generate. Therefore, what I can think of doing is taking this field, q adjoins zeta 5, and hiding the generator of the basis and then bringing it back. And in doing so, I actually am constructing a function, actually a homomorphism of fields, from q adjoins zeta 5 back to itself. So we're going down to the rationals by hiding zeta 5 and then coming back to the extended field. And in that process, we're taking our original zeta 5 and coming back with something that might be zeta 5 raised to any power from 1 through 4. What we get is an automorphism of this field. In other words, it's a homomorphism of this field to itself. And it's an automorphism over the rationals, because when I hide zeta 5 and then bring it back, reincarnate it as something else, actually the rational numbers themselves are not moving. They're staying in place during each one of these automorphism operations. Let's quickly take a look at what this story would look like when k was equal to 8, our example from the previous video. The 8th cyclotomic field over q has a basis, for example, 1 i radical 2 and i radical 2. It's also degree 4 over the rationals, this time with a minimal polynomial t to the 4th plus 1. If we think of that extended field as a 4th dimensional vector space over q, then let's think about the process of exchanging square root of 2, sticking it into a hat, and bringing it back out. What choices can we get from outside of that magician's hat that will generate the same subfield that square root of 2 did? Well, we could bring square root of 2 back out, and that would still work. But the only other choice that we can bring out of that hat that generates the same subfield as the square root of 2 did, and therefore is indistinguishable from the square root of 2 from an algebraic perspective, is the opposite of the square root of 2. Because if I stick this rabbit into the hat and I come back out with i instead, then that element is not indistinguishable from square root of 2 because it doesn't generate the same subfield that the square root of 2 did. In fact, it generates q adjoin i over q. So when square root of 2 goes into the hat, it has to come back out as either positive square root of 2 or negative square root of 2. It can't come out as an i because we can tell the difference between the bunny with the sunglasses and the bunny without the sunglasses. In fact, if something comes out of the hat as an i, it must have either been i or minus i. Those are the two uh, basis elements that are indistinguishable that generate the subfield q adjoin i over q. And so it turns out that if we think about i radical 2, it's going to follow suit, right? If I flip the sign on i, then I'm going to flip the sign on i radical 2 because we need this to be a homomorphism of fields and therefore it has to preserve multiplication. Same thing with the square root of 2. So we don't get to choose what i radical 2 does independently. But we do get to choose when we put this rabbit into the hat and bring it back out, whether we flip the sign on the square root of 2 or whether we flip the sign on the i. So what's the difference? In the example on the left, where k was prime, it had four different automorphisms corresponding to raising zeta 5 to four different distinct powers. And those k minus 1 automorphisms, those four automorphisms, actually form a cyclic group with the operation of composition of functions. And that cyclic group is zk minus 1. But actually, a better way to think about what that cyclic group is 
is just to think about how these numbers one through four behave with respect to function composition. Because we're raising powers to powers, those exponents multiply. And so the operation that we want in our cyclic group is actually the operation of multiplication of residues modulo four in this case. So the group we're talking about is really the multiplicative group of units modulo five, which we called U4 in group theory. But in the case of k equals eight, we had only these two elements which were indistinguishable one from another, square root of two and minus square root of two. Those were indistinguishable and so we can flip flop them if we want to. We can change the sign on just the square root of two. We also have these other two bunnies that are indistinguishable, i and negative i, so we can flip the sign on the i without changing the algebraic structure. We can also do both, flip the sign on both the square root of two and the i, because the square root of twos are indistinguishable by their signs and the i's are indistinguishable by their signs. So we could do both, or we could do neither. Right. We could change the signs on either one of them and just get the identity function. And so again, we end up with four automorphisms of the eighth cyclotomic field over Q. But the difference is, these automorphisms do not form a cyclic group because they all have order two, except for the identity, which has order one. So in fact, because all of our non-trivial elements here have order two and we have a group of order four, this automorphism group is actually isomorphic to the Klein four group. It's not cyclic. And when K is composite, that's going to be the case, that its automorphisms do not form a cyclic group. So that was a quick tour through the difference in the structure of the cyclotomic fields, depending on whether K is prime, in which case its automorphisms form a nice friendly cyclic group, a little merry-go-round, versus if K is not prime, in which its automorphisms don't form a cyclic group. Luckily, it's always abelian in this case, but it's not going to be cyclic if K is not prime. Cyclotomic extensions are going to be one of our principal tools in constructing splitting fields in this course. And it's going to be really a key to the proof that the fifth order polynomials don't necessarily have a solution in radicals. So hang on to this video. You might need to come back and watch it again later on to really fully appreciate its placement within the circle of ideas that form the end of abstract algebra two.